Today's episode of The Michelle Show is brought to you by mtgox.com and usgoldcoins.com, 1-800-HOT-COIN, and Mezzy Grill, M-E-Z-E Grill.com. Hi, and welcome to today's episode of The Michelle Show. Today's Thursday, July 28th, and thank you so much for joining me today. We have a very interesting topic for you today. It's a we're going to be discussing cosmetic surgery, uh, specifically uh, the topic of how to make a decision about uh, getting cosmetic surgery, whether in your home country, uh, here in the United States, or outside of the United States. Um, uh, the guest joining us today is Annette Arguelles from Miami, Florida. Can we get Annette? Are you there, Annette? Can you hear me? I can hear you. Okay. Annette, uh, tell us what, when exactly was it that you uh, received uh, the cosmetic procedure that we're going to be discussing today? Well, I had the surgery done in Colombia, and I went for um, liposuction on my back and um, on my legs, different areas. Well, first, was- first let, let's go back to uh, how, long, how long ago was this? This was in um, September 2004. Okay, so it's been, it's been several years now. Yes. Okay, and what prompted you to, to get the cosmetic surgery? Exactly what was it that you were going to Columbia? Uh, what type of surgery were you going to, to get? I went to get um, liposuction, again, on my back. And I went to have, uh, I had implants already that I just wanted them to get lifted a little. Um, and that's um, basically what I went to get. Okay, so it, it, basically liposuction on your back, and then you already had, you implants. had already gotten breast implants uh, previously. You just wanted to get them uh, touched up somewhat. Right. Okay, how did, how did you decide on the particular doctor, the particular provider, that did the surgery. Okay. Well, I had a. I used to work for um, Jackson Hospital, so I had a friend that um, her mom had gone for surgery uh, in Colombia with this particular doctor, and um, she turned out beautifully. Uh, her her body was totally transformed, and um, I decided that I wanted to have it with the same doctor. I wanted, you know, the same thing. And um, so she she had she had multiple surgeries in it with the same. She, with the same doctor in the same yeah. visit, or did she go back to this doctor to this doctor subsequently on you know more than one visit? No, she had everything on the same visit. Uh, she had okay. like uh, liposculpturing. She had a tummy tuck. She had her breast done. A bunch of things done on the same day. Okay, so when you saw her after the fact, and right. she looked spectacular. Spectacular. Okay, so was your decision in in going overseas for the surgery? Was it was it mostly due to how, to how great your friend looked, or was there a, a cost factor involved also? Was it less expensive for you to, to, to well, go to Colombia? Both. I wanted to look better, and, um, and, I wa- and, I, and it was more affordable. So, I mean, doing okay. all those surgeries here would have been, I mean, a lot of money. And over there, they do it for almost nothing. Okay, so when you spoke to your friend about her particular provider, uh, she made a recommendation, and did you go to a local office in Miami, or did you just explain to me a little bit more about the process after that? Well, she gave me the phone number, and I contacted them, and I went straight to their office, which was right by my house in Hialeah in Miami, and um, they didn't, though, want to take me at the moment because um, it was too soon. They were leaving, like, they only they were leaving like two weeks later or three weeks later, and they said it was I was you know it was too short of notice that I needed to get a clearance before going and the whole thing. And I was like, oh, but I can you know I can get a clearance. And well, I can but get explain it, right? to me, go back so that the viewers understand exactly what it was that you were doing. This is a this is a medical provider in Colombia that also had offices in Miami. He's a provider in Colombia who has an office in Miami, like to recruit people to take them to Colombia. To get these surgeries done so, over there. So when you go to his office in Miami, um, is it is it set up like a like a cosmetic uh, surgery type of place, or is it? I mean, wh- how do they? 
Uh, how were they set up exactly in, in Miami? Okay, they're not set up as anything cosmetic. They're set up to be like a uh, to lose weight or to, or for massages, massage therapy. Okay, uh, so it, like it, it's kind of like it seemed like you were visiting a doctor's office of some kind or at least a like medical a center. Cosmetologist or something. Okay, or a cosmetologist's office, right? Yes, but nothing like a plastic surgery office. Right, they weren't promoting. They weren't, they weren't advertising or promoting their services out of that particular location as being a place where you go to receive local uh, cosmetic procedures, right? Right. Okay. And so when you went to that office, what was, the, what was the process like there? Well, I went finally with my clearance, and um, they just, um, they took care, the, the, what I paid them took care of the fees to go on the, you know, the airplane fees, the hotel fees their fees it took care of everything so basically i just had to show up the day that they told me with my passport and i was you know i would i was all set up to have the surgery over there okay so from the time that you visited them uh they scheduled you for what the following month no no i was scheduled to leave like in two or three weeks i believe it was yeah, okay the surgery. and, and in september sometime 2004. okay so when um they, they required of you some kind of medical clearance and then you were good to go and you, you went ahead and flew. Did you go with a group of people or, or did you take anybody from your family? Did you travel alone? No, I traveled alone. Um, and it was with a, well, with a group that they had already uh, recruited. That they had recruited. These were all people that were going to the same yeah. facility to get cosmetic procedures done, correct? Right. Some were going for a facelift, others were going for tummy tucks alone, others for the liposculpturing, different things, different women, like maybe a group of five. Okay. So um, then explain to me a little more about what happened once you got there. What, what, well, what once happened once you were there? there the, um, once I got there, I had one day to go, you know, to rest, and then the next day was my surgery. Um, for my surgery lasted, I was told, 10 hours which is way too long for a cosmetic surgery wow. to begin with. Um, once I woke up from the surgery, I was in extreme pain. I mean, nothing helped me. No medication helped me. No, I didn't have an appetite. I was, I, was, I, knew, I was feeling bad and miserable from the moment I woke up. So did something, did something feel uh, not right from the moment that you woke up from the surgery? Absolutely. From the moment I woke up. I knew there was something wrong with me that was different. I mean, I had gone through plastic surgery in the past. I had, you know, I had reconstructed my breast, and I had had surgeries in the past, and nothing felt right. I wasn't, they offered me food. I didn't want any. I, I didn't feel right at all. Okay, and so when you complained to the, to the doctor or the nurses, uh, what happened? They said everything was normal. Everything was normal. Even when I got, I started um, um, coming with, fe I started getting fevers and spiking fevers, um, and they still insisted that everything was normal. What they would do to alleviate my pain partly was um, drain. I had like these little drains on my back, and they would use them like to drain, like to take out like some kind of accumulation of water, like mixed with like bloody, like you know, right. um, from my back. And how long, how long were you hospitalized in their facility? Were you in a hospital? Were you in a medical center? It was like an outpatient facility. Okay. And I was only there over uh, that night, maybe like 24 hours. That's it. So over the course of the 24 hours, you were in extreme pain. You complained about it. And all that they did was just drain you of that accumulation of, yeah, that's of it. liquid. Yeah. Okay. Was the doctor trying to be reassuring that what you were going through was normal? Well, yeah, he was trying to be reassuring, but there was a one time that I, um, that I kind of caught him speaking to, there were two doctors, the plastic surgeon, the plastic surgeon and the general medicine doctor. And I kind of saw them at one point when they were doing the draining that they looked at each other like, this is not doing well, you know? And they mentioned that they mentioned like kind of a diagnosis like it was like um, necrotic tissues, like in the back of in my back. Right. But at that moment, I didn't know what that was, so I left it alone. But I didn't realize that something was definitely wrong when I saw them whispering, like you know, like they didn't want me to see what they were saying, their faces, you know. Right. I happened to have looked back and caught them in the, you know, 
when they were talking like that. So, so I knew that there was something wrong with me the whole time. So and that at, I had to get back to Miami. At, at what point did they tell you that it was okay to leave? Well, um, they never, they, it was a trip of 10 days. So at the 10th day, it was already, I was scheduled, you know, to fly back to Miami. And over the course of the 10 days, what, what were you feeling? Nothing, just waiting to be able to leave. And um, the same procedure, draining and back to bed. I was never able to wear the girdle that everybody wears, like so that you can, sh you know, so your body could uh, take, get its form or whatever they use it for. Right. I was never able, able to fit into that, and I would see other women fitting themselves into it, and I was never able to. They were kind of forcing me to do it. I just didn't accept. I didn't do it. So over oh. the course, you were, you were there at that outpatient type facility for the course of the entire 10 just, days in the hotel already oh in the hotel okay yeah. now was the doctor visiting you on a regular basis at the yes, hotel we visit every day okay and i would also have to go to his office for the draining for the draining right so on your last day there what was the conversation like he said it was well, okay for you to leave on the last day they they clearly told me that if i was asked in the airport um, any questions about going to that country for plastic surgery that I should say no, that I just went for tourism. And um, so I, I agreed, but um, I was once I was in the airport, I wasn't doing well at all. I felt like fainting, and I was left alone. They weren't even by my side helping me. Really? So, yeah. So, so, so uh, who now who transported you to the airport? Was it the, the people the from doctor. the medical center? With the doctor and the group of people that had went the secretary of the doctor, the girls, that the ladies who had had the surgery as well. Right. And, and me, but I was the worst one. I never recuperated. So I was tears. Clearly, you were feeling a lot of pain, and they still allowed you to get off of, uh, off of the bus yes, and, and, yes. and go to the airport. Yes. Um, one of the, uh, in the airport, someone that worked there spotted me, like one of the guards, and she approached me, and she's like, what's wrong with you? And I was I first said nothing because I was scared. It was in the back of my mind that he had told me, don't say what you were here for. Right. But um, I felt like if I was going to faint and I just, I went up to the lady again after I had told her nothing and I told her, look, something is wrong with me. I don't feel well. You know, she, she asked me what I was there for. I told her that I had been there for plastic surgery. And then she told me, well, then you need to get cleared by the doctor here in our airport in order to be able to fly. And I said, fine, but my, my flight was leaving in like 45 minutes, and the doctor was all across the whole airport. So um, I saw a young guy, a young boy that worked there in the airport, and I, told, I remember I told him, listen, um, I can, do you think you could get me to the other side of the airport where the doctor's at? Um, like as soon as, I mean, as fast as you can, because my flight leaves in 45 minutes, I have $20 I can give you. And he said, sure, sure, I'll, I'll get you there. And he ran with me over... Every, I mean, he was going super fast to get me there in the wheelchair. And um, when I got to the doctor, she said, all she told me was, I'll clear you if you can stand up from the wheelchair and walk a straight line back and forth and you're cleared to go. I was like, wow, well, that's going to be, I didn't say it, but I was thinking in my mind that that's going to be hard. I stood up because um, I, um, I was saying if I, if I stayed there, I wasn't going to live. I knew that. Did it, did it cross your mind to stay and go to a hospital? No, it never. I was ne It never crossed my mind. Or, or were you not? Were, were did you not want to do that? Was that not no. a possibility to you? I felt that if they got me into that situation, be, be, they were gonna, gonna, you know, they were not gonna save me, you know. So I never, it ne I never was gonna stay in any hospital. You there. wanted I to get back. You wanted to get back to the U.S. So one way or I mean, another. I knew that that was the only way I was gonna get better. Okay. So he, the kid, I, I made, I did the walk. And I sat back down. I remember crying the whole way back until I got on the airplane and until I got home. And um, what happened once, once you once you got home? What happened? Well, once I got home, I kept uh, spiking fevers and um, until I, I kept waiting because I kept contacting their office to tell them that I kept spiking the fevers and they kept insisting it was normal. So um, I visited their office for, again, another drainage. They did another draining to my back. And like I said, I felt a little better when I got back, to the, to, back home. But the fevers would not stop until I just told my, uh, my husband at the time, uh, you need to take me to the hospital. Something's definitely wrong. How long, how long were you here uh, before you took that trip to the hospital? It took me four days to decide to go to the hospital. Okay. 
Yeah. So, so when you, when, which hospital did you go to? I went to Palmetto. Okay, so locally near your home, you went to the hospital. Right, that was the first hospital I went to. And, and what was the prognosis there? Well, their prognosis was just to, um, they tried to help me as far as my breasts were, were um, they tried to help me. But my back they kept ignoring, and that was where I had the most pain. So at the end, all they said that they needed to intubate me and that I was not breathing properly and that I couldn't, my potassium was low, that I wasn't going to, uh, that I was not functioning properly, that all my labs were pretty messed up, you know. So ba and, basically and they wanted to put you on life support. They pretty much, yeah, they just wanted me to be down and, and intubated. Now, and at, at, that, at that point, what were your, what were, was the scar, well, you weren't scarring yet, so what were the injuries looking like? Were you bleeding? Were they purple? No. Were you bruised? No, my back was like, was black completely black like there was nothing there was not no blood oxygen no oxygen going through there was no n nothing was working back there I mean it was completely black bruising was not it wasn't even bruised it was the color black why did it why did it take you four days to get to the hospital initially well because it never crossed my mind that I was going to be in that bad shape you know you, you thought never, you thought it was just taking you yeah a little was, longer than usual to recuperate I was trying to think positive thinking that it was just taking me a little longer until I saw that the fever wasn't going away. And then, you know, I went, I guess I was a little scared. So how long were you at Palmetto hospital? I was in Palmetto for 10 days. Okay. So basically what, what they, what they recommended that you do was since your vitals weren't looking too good, they wanted right. to intubate you Well, in the, in the form of uh, putting you under almost right. Right. Right, and I, I told them no. Um, I was in their ICU unit, and um, I totally declined their recommendations. And they wanted me to sign all this paperwork, but by this time I was angry because they, you know, I, I couldn't believe that I was in the United States and there was nothing else that they can do. That all they, their, their solution was just to intubate me and, and just medicate me for pain, and that was it. Leave it alone. And... So I was angry by this time, and I didn't sign anything, and I just uh, told them not to touch me, that I was leaving them. Do you feel that you got some resistance from the hospital because they knew that you had received a cosmetic procedure overseas? For sure. And, you know, we're living in a, in a country where um, people file lawsuits every day for different things. Uh, do you think that the hospital felt like you were a liability just walking in the door? Yeah, not maybe the, the the doctors, the plastic surgeons that work for the hospital, at least in Palmetto, they didn't want to feel, they didn't want their name anywhere. They didn't want to touch me because I was, they, I could be confused. And maybe um, in the future, if I try to sue them, maybe the injury that I'm suing them for is not his responsibility, but Columbia's responsibility, which it's been seen before. Right. So a lot of doctors weren't being nice to me when I was there. So Unlike when I went to Jackson everybody was super helpful well talk to me about your transition to Jackson did did uh, did you leave Palmetto uh, on your own free will did they did they let you go How, tell me a little bit more about that well at first I told them if they can get me a transfer to Jackson they told me um, they had no beds then I told them that I'll pay for an ambulance to transport me to do the transfer and that I would wait till there was a bed available but that I didn't want to be there they were very, they were not helpful at all. I had to um, transport myself and um, uh, to Jackson. So you you basically left Palmetto out of your own free will, and you dr and well, you somebody drove you, right? Right, my ex drove you to Jackson. So what happened once you got to Jackson? Well, um, being that I used to work there, I kind of knew how the setup was. So I told my ex husband, you know, when we walk in. You're not going to look at anybody. We're just going to keep on walking straight to the nurse's station and I'll do all the talking, you know. So when I got there, they had given me a copy of my labs. Um, I went straight to the nurse's station and I told them, listen, um, here are a copy of my labs. I just left the ICU department at Palmetto Hospital and I need for you to call Dr. Byers or call whatever surgeon you have here because I'm dying. I remember I told them just like that. And they just told me to lie down 
and that they would get them for me. And Dr. Byers, which was a doctor that I knew for many years and was a friend of mine, uh, she came to the rescue. And I was in surgery. After I walked in, I was in surgery maybe half an hour after. Okay, so, you, so yeah. you went in immediately to surgery? Yeah. I had already tried to contact her on my way over there. So she knew I was going. Okay. And so how long were you in surgery there? I don't remember how long I was in surgery, um, but it was a while. They were trying to take out everything that was necrotic. So they, um, they, they didn't get, before you went into surgery, did they give you a prognosis? Did they tell you what no, you had? No, she, she knew it was gangrene. Uh, what it was, they diagnosed it as to be gangrene, and they knew they had to move on it because it spread fast. It's a bacteria that spreads really fast. And um, that's what she did. When she opened, when she, started, when she cut and opened, she said that she didn't know whether to close me back up or to continue because um, she had never seen or smelled anything like that. Wow. She, but she did it. She continued the surgery because I was young and, and just to give it a chance. And you had gangrene on your back as well as your breasts? Yes, all over. Everywhere that they stuck the liposuctioning thing, right. everywhere I had the infection. Everywhere that there was a little spot of, that, of, of what they used to do liposuction, right. everywhere there, that they used that machine on had um, infection, had gangrene. So basically, mm -hmm. ba so basically the infection came from, and you tell me if I'm wrong, but the infection came from the doctors in Colombia having used uh, medical instruments that were not sterilized. Right, right. They hadn't disinfect. They didn't disinfect them. Right. So something as something as simple as that created this right. very serious problem. Right. And I could have. I mean, I think I could have caught anything that the person before me had. I mean, they really messed up. So when you were in surgery at Jackson, that surgery took a number of hours because they had to remove. Uh, yeah. They had to remove all of the gangrene. All the dead skin, yes. Right. I mean, it's a miracle that you even survived because most people with gangrene, right. you know, uh, if it's, e it's easy to amputate an arm or a leg or any of right. the body's appendages, but when you have it on your torso, right, right. Uh, it's very, very dangerous. Very dangerous. They had to go in um, about 12 times before getting all of the bacteria out, all of the infection out. Um, it got to the point that you can see my spinal cord in the in my back, clearly. Unbelievable. Mm -hmm. So, uh, how many surgeries did you have? It was uh, after here that in Jackson. It was about twelve surgeries. Over the next over was it immediately over after the next over the over five weeks or six weeks? Over five weeks. I was in ICU all that time. Unbelievable. Now, so tell me about your hospital stay. How long were you there? I was there almost five months. Um, my hospital stay at the beginning was awful. I mean, I would wake up and be angry that I was still alive because I couldn't tolerate the pain. I didn't want them to help me. I just wanted to die because the pain was unbearable. Um, it, it was, I couldn't tolerate it. I, I, they were giving me morphine for pain, but morphine was not helping me. Until finally one day I just um, told them, is there anything else you can give me besides morphine? And they finally gave me uh, Dilaudid, which is a very highly addictive narcotic. But let me tell you, thanks to that medication, I was able to, I wanted, I, it, it helped me fight back. It helped me uh, want to live and want to help myself because before I, was, I just couldn't tolerate the pain. That kind of alleviated. That was the only thing that was able to help me. How, how, how is it with such major injuries to, to, your, you know, to the front of your body and to the back of your body, how is it that you were able uh, to lay down even? Well, it's very uncomfortable. I still to today, I feel like if I'm carrying like a heavy vest in my back, um, it doesn't feel like even to, bend, like to get something that falls on the floor, bending over hurts. It hurts my back. Um, like when I'm sleeping, if I'm going to go to the other, move from side to side or, you know, lay on my, lie on my stomach. Every movement that I'm going to do, I have to sit up and then go to the side or sit up and lie on, you know, on my stomach. Whatever I'm going to do, it's, I have to always sit up so I won't, so my back won't hurt as much. Wow. Let's take one moment uh, to thank our sponsors. I'll be right back with you in a moment, Annette. 
Our first sponsor is MTGOX, MountGox.com. They offer online exchange services for Bitcoins. They now take the Euro, the British Pound, the Australian Dollar, and coming soon, any day now, is the Canadian Dollar as well. Our second sponsor is usgoldcoins.com, our trusted advisor for investments in rare gold and silver coins. They can be reached at 1-800-HOT-COIN. Andy takes the mystery out of buying silver and gold by holding your hands. Uh, they definitely take a hands-on approach, and it's better to call and speak directly to someone at 1-800-HOT-COIN. Our third sponsor is Mezzy Grill, M-E-Z-E Grill.com where authentic Mediterranean food meets modern flavor. They're now serving breakfast and they're located in New York City on 8th Avenue at, 50, at 55th Street, just a couple of blocks from south, uh, or, sorry, just a couple of blocks south of Columbus Circle. Okay, uh, now, uh, so you were in the hospital for five months almost, correct? Yeah. Okay, so, I mean, during that time, since your, the injuries to your back were so severe, I mean, were, were, they, were they wrapping up your injuries and then you would basically to sleep? Right. I mean, how would you sleep? Would you lay on your back to sleep? I would, they ordered a special bed for me. It was, um, it was a special bed and um, they would do, wrap, they wrapped my back. I don't remember what they would call it, but they would do um, wraps that were some were humid and I would have to lie down on this special bed. And, um, and that's it. They would do, um, I would have to go to hyperbarics therapy also to help me cure faster. And, um, during, during the course of that time that you were in the hospital, I mean, your injuries were so severe. I can't imagine that you could really take the time, but did you try to contact the medical provider in Colombia that, that where you got this procedure done? Oh, yeah, I tried contacting them, and they um, said it was not their fault, that they tried to blame it on, on the doctors here. So, and, so they know, just they anymore. So they just didn't want to hear it. Right. No, they offered for me to go back and to that they'll pay for all the grafts, the skin grafts that I would need, that they would be, you know, they would pay for certain things, but, you know. I mean, so, at, at that point, the, you're, you're, I can't even imagine, at that point, being in that condition in the hospital, under any circumstances, I can't imagine anybody would want to go back. No, 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 I'm <laughs> saying that was not an option. That's not, that's not an option. I couldn't talk to them again after that. Now, did you ever investigate as to any legal recourse um, in that country? It, I mean, is that even an option? Um, no, I just um, contacted attorneys here to see if I was able to do anything. I took pictures of my back like when I was in the hospital at that moment when it was just like the skin, the bare skin. And um, I sent this, these attorneys, like two or three attorneys, pictures to see if they can help me. But they were not able to help me. And I'm assuming you gave them the information to the local office that you had been to, correct? Yes, I had. And did they try to pursue contacting them in any way they didn't know when they, when anybody tried to call them about me they would just deny they did that they knew me that they ever met me that i ever went to columbia for surgery just denied the whole thing really so wh what did your attorney say basically well, with attorneys didn't want to waste uh, spend any money like hiring nurses and people to investigate because they weren't sure if they were going to be able to uh, make any money out of it so no one really took the time to investigate anything so after all of after all of this you were basically not able uh, to file any kind of claim you weren't able to pursue it and I mean how did you cover your medical bills um, when I was at Jackson Jackson got me uh, an emergency Medicaid so the Medicaid paid for half of my bills or more than half of my bills the rest of the bills I still paid. Do you know? Do you know what the total amount was? It was over two million dollars. Over two million dollars. Yeah, just the hyperbarics. I had a hundred and sixty-five, I think, uh, therapies of hyperbarics, and hyperbarics each day was a thousand. E explain a little bit to the audience uh, exactly what the hyperbaric chamber does. Well, the hyperbaric chamber is. Um, it looks sort of like a submarine. Not a many. Not many hospitals have this. Jackson Memorial has it. Um, 
It looks like kind of like a submarine. It's made of iron. You go in, and what it does is, it don't, you could only use the hyperbaric chamber if um, you have an open wound. So there's a lot of cancer patients in the chamber with you, and all is because you need to cure faster for some reason, either because whatever you have is spreading fast, or it, it, there has to be a reason behind it. You have to qualify to, to be able to be in there. So um, basically what they do is they, you, they close you up in there, and then they put like kind of like... Um, a helmet, like kind of like an astronaut kind of thing, over your head, and um, the, it starts gra getting pressure when you're in there. Like if somebody's diving, let's say like 50 feet, so that starts to get pressure. You have to like blow out so that your ears don't, you know, you have to hear your ears popping. And um, after it, it reaches a certain amount of pressure, um, it starts blowing out 100% oxygen, and you have to be in there about three to four hours. And um, that's what helped me cure faster. I was I was supposed to be hospitalized for about a year, and I was hospitalized for yeah even less than the amount. I was hospitalized for five months. So the hyperbaric chamber creates like a, a very sterile environment. Yes. That's for right. and how long? How long are you are you in there for each treatment? For three hours, four hours. I don't remember. It was three or four hours, but oh, it's a while. So each time you have to be in there three to four hours. Yes, they medicate it. They, they even could go in there and medicate you when you need your pain medicine, when you need any medicine, they can go in there and medicate you. So you just have to lie in there very still? Very, you just lie in there still. You can talk to the people that are there, but you're wearing that helmet thing. And um, it's pretty uncomfortable because if you're claustrophobic, I mean, you're in, you can't go get out and it's, it's uncomfortable. So how many, how many of those treatments did you get, did you say? 165. Over the course of the, the few months you were there? Yes, and then even after, I, I had to continue going. Wow, that's unbelievable. Mm -hmm. So um, what else, other than the hyperbaric chamber, uh, give us an idea of the other types of treatment that were involved in helping you get cured. Well, they also had something called the VAC. They placed it on my back. It's like um, a very strong tape. And what it does, it's it vacuums. It, it, it vacuums. It makes your skin, since I had so much skin that it was like, it was so in, like, towards, you know, it was like the spinal cord. You can see my spinal cord. So it needed to grow out. And skin doesn't really grow out by itself. So they, they put that back on you, and then it starts suctioning. And that was the way that my skin was able to grow out a little bit so that my body could be shaped. That's, that's interesting. I think we have a picture of the injuries to your back. Uh, let's take a look at, at that for a moment. Is it on? Okay, here uh, the viewers can see, uh, obviously we weren't gonna uh, photograph the, you know, the injuries to your breasts. Your breasts were right. removed and, and you later had to, had to uh, get reconstructive surgery to your breasts, but basically this is the injury that you're left with now. This is what your back looks like right now. How does this, how does this compare to your original injuries? Oh no, uh, my original injuries were my whole, my entire back. That's just a little part of my back. The injuries before was my entire back. What, so they, your your they entire back would would you say from your shoulders down? A little lower than my shoulders, all the way yeah down all, to the, my spinal cord. So down to your hip area or above that? A little lower than my hip area. Okay. So yeah, what they did to help me so that I would require less skin was they did kind of like a tuck. That's how you see it smaller there. Um, they kind of pulled from the top, from the, from the sides, you know, to make it a little smaller so that that way I would require less skin. Wow. Yeah, I, it looks like a much smaller injury um, right. than it would have originally been given that your entire back from top to bottom, right. uh, you know, had basically had to be removed due to gangrene. Now, what about, what about, uh, your breasts? How did, how, how long did you have to go without breasts before those were reconstructed? They told me, they recommended that I wait a year before, um, going for plastic surgery again. I, I definitely needed to have the plastic surgery because there was no way I can live with the breasts the way that they looked.
They were t they were awful. They didn't even look like breasts. How did during during this uh, this whole time in it? I mean, over this first year, how did you feel about yourself? How did you how did you feel in this new body? Because basically, you had a new body. Terrible. Terrible. Um, I regretted every minute of it. It was a very hard, difficult year for me. I have to say. What uh, what what was your biggest regret at that point that you that you uh, chose that particular doctor I mean what do you think you could have done differently uh, your, your case is not the only case like this it's one of the worst that I've seen but you know that there are people um, and it's very important for me to, to tell the viewers at, at this point in the conversation that you uh, you can have uh, uh, an instance of negligence in any country, including the United States. There are good doctors and bad doctors everywhere. Um, the whole purpose of this conversation today is so the viewers can learn something from your particular experience and think about what they can do differently when making a decision, um, especially when you go overseas. And this is true if you live in another country and you're coming to the United States uh, for surgery as well. It's very important that you understand the laws in those countries, that you understand uh, what, the, what the recourse is in case you're confronted with this type of situation. I think it's also important that you're uh, accompanied by someone, by a loved one maybe, and, and you don't take this trip by yourself. Uh, it, it's never the intention of this show to be one-sided, and it's never my own personal intention to be one-sided. So it's important that you, the viewers, understand that uh, my personal belief is not necessarily that uh, you get better treatment in the United States. There are many malpractice situations in the, in the United States as well. However, there is recourse here. There is accountability. There's a system in place that will ensure that if there is malpractice done to you, that you can file a claim. You can hold somebody accountable. A doctor's license is at stake. And I just think it's important um, to really research properly all of your options. And if you're going to make a decision to go overseas, because there are some brilliant doctors in many countries over, overseas, especially in South America, uh, you just have to be more educated and better prepared when making a decision. So I, I, don't, I don't think that you were necessarily mistaken in having gone to Colombia for the surgery, but just the, your process in getting there maybe could have been different. What do you think you could have done differently to have avoided this problem? Well, in a way, um, when I, the plastic surgery, the plastic surgeon, um, it, it was the facility's fault that um, I became infected, if you think about it, because the, it was the instruments that were not cleaned and not sterilized. And I don't think doctors sterilize, you know, their own instruments. I think that Correct. they're placed for you there, you know. So, you know, the surgeon, however, you know, I don't agree that plastic, you should be in, uh, in plastic surgery for 10 hours. And, um, like, here I know there are guidelines as to how many hours, how many things you can do, you know, on, in, in one surgery, you know. And over there, they're not, there isn't those kinds of rules. And if there is, they don't really respect those laws. Well, do you think that before you left Colombia to come back to the U.S., that the doctor was aware, was definitely aware that you were experiencing a problem? That, yes. that was outside of the normal realm of, you know, the way that someone is supposed to feel when they come out of surgery. He knew exactly how I was feeling. There was no way I can hide it. I mean, all I can do was cry. All I can do was, I mean, I was feeling uh, really, really bad. So, I mean, everybody knew that I was not doing well. So, uh, as a matter of fact, like the girls that had become friends with me in the trip at the beginning, towards the end, they didn't really want to talk to me much. I think they kind of knew that I wasn't doing well and in the future there was going to be some kind of problem or lawsuit and they stopped talking to me. Did you ever, did you ever keep in touch with... I, we kept in touch with, I kept in touch with one of them for a little bit when I first got here, but she disappeared as well and she stopped calling me and um, after I got really sick, she stopped calling me. Really? So you want to be a part of it, you know? Right. But, but nobody ever, none, none of those women flat out told you that, did no. they? No. You just didn't hear from them again after that? I just never heard from them again, and I tried to call them, and they would just not answer. Now, all of those women that went on that trip with you, they were, none of them were accompanied by, by a relative or a loved one either, 
No? No. No. Everybody went alone. So once uh, once you got out of the hospital, you uh, let's go back to the, the, the breast reconstruction. Did you, you did get that done within, within a year? Yes. Um, I was getting a little anxious, so I started calling my plastic surgeon, which was the one that helped me in the hospital. Um, his name is Dr. Armstrong. I started contact calling him at nine months, like trying to get him to do the surgery before. So, he, you know, he didn't. He just, uh, he basically, like when it was about, when I called him at the 10th or 11th month, he, he said, well, I'll give you an appointment. And um, he finally gave me an appointment, and I ended up having the surgery exactly like a year, exactly a year after I got to the hospital. So, so uh, obviously, we're not going to be showing pictures of the outcome of that surgery. But tell me in your own words, um, what was the outcome, and, and were you happy with the reconstruction? I was very happy. I was happy that he had to do the surgery in two parts. The first part was to reconstruct the breast because it didn't even look like a breast, which I was pretty happy alone with the reconstruction. I was when I saw the reconstruction, I was I thought that was it that I didn't need another surgery, but the doctor was said that no that there was another surgery where he's going to place the implant and it was going to be much nicer, and he was right. I mean, I went for the second surgery it was just it was just placing the implant, and um. Yeah, I have to say, I mean, you can tell that my breasts went through something because they don't look perfect, but they're, I'm happy. I'm very happy with the outcome. We have a, a few comments in the chat room uh, from viewers that are watching you live right now. Um, obviously, we're not going to show pictures <laughs> of, of the breast reconstruction, but can you stand up uh, just so that the viewers can see what, uh, what you look like, you know, with clothes on? Are you... I don't know if you can see me. If you stand, if you... I'm wearing... Sh Could you see me? Yes. <laughs> yes. Great. And you can't even see anything on your back either with your clothing, which is fantastic. Mm-hmm. Okay. The guests approve. <laughs> in, the, in, in the chat, they're saying that you look great. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Okay. And now, let's talk about... Uh, a little bit about your personal life at the time. Were you in a relationship when you went to uh, to Colombia initially for the surgery? I was, yes. And uh, was he supportive during this entire process? I can't even imagine what it's like for, for a significant other to have to endure uh, everything that came afterwards. He was very supportive. I was, I, was, I was the one that was kicking him out of the hospital all the time, telling him to find another wife or another... Because I didn't think I was ever going to be better. I, I thought that I was not going to ever get better or look normal, you know. Um, and he was. He was very supportive. Now, what has the process been like over the last few years in your, in your self-image, in your body image? Uh, how do you feel about yourself now? Well, um, I feel fine. I mean, I do have a little bit of a complex, like, when it deals with... Uh, I haven't had um, too many relationships after because it's a little hard for me. I don't know when to tell the person that I have this scar in my back. You know, some people don't like it. You know, some people don't mind it at all. But um, I've gotten a little better about it. I mean, ha have, you had, have you had an experience where... Yes. <laughs> you know what I'm going to say, that's right? That's probably why. <laughs> yeah, I had an experience where I started to um, date someone. And um, we went to the beach together. I had already told him about my back. So I thought I'm in the clear, you know, I'm good. He could deal with it. Everything's good. And when we went to the beach, he saw my back and he, I did notice he wasn't very talkative. And um, later on, we spoke on the phone and he told me, you know, you had told me about your back, but I didn't know it was so bad. I mean, really, I cannot deal with something like that. And I was like, wow, I used to think about those things like when I was in the hospital, but I never really saw it happening to me. You know? Wow. So he, I mean... You have to appreciate that he was honest about it at least because a lot of guys would have just never called you again and, and you're left wondering, you know, what, what happened. No, I, I, I did appreciate it. So from that moment on, do you feel like you need to be more graphic or actually show somebody the scar and just get it out of the way at the beginning when you first meet them? 
I try to not show, I don't try to show them. I try to warn them, like tell them that I do have this huge scar because I feel that there's people that it does bother. Um, there's people that it doesn't bother at all, you know, that um, they see it different. Um, which, I mean, the scar has nothing to do with the way that I am, obviously. I mean, it's just... Of course, thing. it doesn't define you as a person. Right. So, you know, but I do kind of want, I like to tell them because if there are people that cannot deal with it, they should know, you know, they should, it should be fair and they should know. And, um, and what about other relationships? What about, I mean, you spent a lot of time in the hospital. Uh, did, yeah. did your friends come and visit? Did you feel that your, your loved ones and your family were supportive? Uh, did some well, things change? I mean, were there people that just disappeared from your life? Yes, there were. Uh, I had a really good friend, which is who I'm at her house right now. She was there the whole time, every single day. And I had good, uh, a lot of, uh, several good friends that went to see me. Um, however, I didn't have support from my family just because my mom was actually sick herself at that time. She was very critical. Um, and she actually passed away the year right after that I got out of the hospital. And um, my, my dad would go to see me every once in a while. Not as much as um, I would have liked, but, you know, there they were people that went to see me. But, again, I was mostly alone during the day. At night, I would have two visitors who were always there, which was my ex-husband and my friend, Annie. So you're, you say your ex-husband, the relationship that you were in, uh, I'm, I'm assuming based on what you just said, that... That, re that relationship did not last? No. No. And the time that I was in the hospital, I guess, being there so many months, he, he kind of cheated. He kind of cheated? That's another topic, so. That's a whole, right, that's a whole other, that's a whole other topic. But did you, did you, did you stay in the relationship until after you? I'm a, yes, I did. I stayed in the relationship till after, and then after I found out, I still stayed in the relationship for two more years after. Okay, so you were, you were together for a couple of years after that. Yes. Yeah. And so now in these, in these last couple of years uh, where your scar is, is definitely, it's still a major scar, but it's a lot better than it used to be, uh, with all of the advancements in, in plastic surgery, have you, been, have you been offered to continue to, to work on it and to make it better? Yeah, they've offered to do it for free uh, at Jackson, as a matter of fact. Um, but I'm, I decided that I wasn't going to do that, that I'm just going to leave it there. It doesn't really, you know, it's who I, you know, it's part of me right now and I'm not going to get rid of it. I said that if I would ever have surgery again, it was going to be something that I needed, not something for cosmetic purposes. Yeah, that's, that's very admirable because I don't know a lot of people that would be willing to live with a major scar like that and not, you know, not have a vanity uh, you know, uh, kick in and, and really make you want to make you want to fix it or make it better. Like I said, I mean, it bothers me when I have to lie down, but I've already gotten used to all those things. You know, I already got used to the whole thing. I'm not going to get rid of it just because, you know, it just, it's like a little reminder, you know, I went through something. It doesn't, doesn't no, and it, no. And listen, it definitely, ma it definitely made you a stronger person. Mm -hmm. You have an unbelievable spirit. Uh, you're a very positive person. And uh, not a lot of people, not a lot of people that don't have the scar that you have uh, feel as well about themselves as you obviously do, which I think is really, really commendable. Because most people that have never undergone this kind of procedure or the problems that came after, you know, uh, and, they, and they still live with a complex about insignificant things about their body. So the fact that you've been able to overcome this and uh, move forward and you have less of a problem with it than the people that look at you, right. uh, I, I think is really an unbelievable thing. Thank so, you. so do you wear a one piece or a bikini to the beach? Bikini. <laughs> Good for you. Good for you. That's, that's fantastic. Do people... I mean, has anybody asked you? Does anybody come up you to know, you and ask you? Some people look and... No, nobody has asked me. Some people are very discreet about looking and some people just look and stare and, and others don't even care. I mean, you get all these kinds of um, reactions out there, you know. I go to the beach a lot, so I know. I, most of the people have seen me, I go to the same place, so a lot of people don't even look anymore, you know. 
Wow. But it doesn't bother me if they look or if they don't look or if they make a comment. It, it really, I don't really care what anybody has to say. If it's negative, I don't care. I, the, you know, this particular topic has many layers. There's one thing that I want to talk about um, that I think is very important. You and I had a conversation prior to the show about the many layers of this topic. And at one point you mentioned about your struggle with the painkillers. Tell me, tell the audience a little bit about that. It was horrible. I was addicted to the Dilaudid and to a lot of uh, medications like to sleep that I was taking, I mean, for five months every four to six hours. So it was not, you know, I, I got addicted to them because I needed it to basically to survive, to be in there. Um, when I got out, I was stuck. I was very addicted to Dilaudid which um, I remember I spent the 31st of December that year in the hospital saying that I was in major pain, which I really wasn't in major pain, only because I wanted them to put it, you know, by, in, my, in my vein. That's all I wanted. When the doctor got there to see me and they told me, where's the pain? I didn't know what they were talking about because all I wanted was the medication. One second. It's, it's okay. <laughs> Sorry. It's okay. And... Um, yeah, so they gave me the medic. It was all the addiction. I was having withdrawals. I would, I mean, I was practically to the point that I was pulling my hairs out, scraping my face. I was going crazy. They had to, um, they had to refer me to pain management, and they started giving me the medication but weaving me off of it. And um, that's how I was able to stop taking it. How long? How long uh, were you taking a pain medication After before you got off? Hospital. I was taking it for like maybe three more months. So you got, you got out of the hospital five months after the, after the, initial, uh, the initial admission. So Correct. once you got out, you spent a couple of months on the pain medication. Right. So you were very lucky that you were able to get off, off of the medication that quickly. Some people, uh, it, it's, a very, it's a very difficult addiction to overcome. It is. Horrible. I then understood, let me tell you, I, I, I understood people that are addicted to different things. I just understood being an addict, what being an addict was like, and it was awful. What, are the, I, what are the withdrawals like? Um, the withdrawals were like, I couldn't sleep at all. I couldn't sleep. I was just uh, anxious, very anxious. Um, you start doing different things like biting my, you know, my mouth or scra uh um, scraping my my face like with my hands, trying to pull my hairs out. I mean, literally trying to pull your ha own hair. So out. you you just do you feel it's like an overwhelming sense yes. of anxiety? It, yes, overwhelming. It's uncontrollable. It's bad. So how did they get you off of that? They started. Um, they kept giving it to me, but just uh, the same dose, just uh, less me less pills. So I was, and then my ex-husband would give it to me. That he was the one that would medicate me. So he would give me exactly the dose that I was supposed to take. So you know, it was half before bedtime or half in the morning, whatever it was recommended. He would do it exactly. That if I would have had it in my possession, I would have probably downed the whole bottle. But he was giving medicine to me according to what the doctor's recommendations were, and that's how I was able to get weaved off of them because. Giving it to me like that, little by little, and cutting the pill smaller and smaller each day. Like, you, I would take the same dose for maybe two or three days. Then they would lower the dose, like, for more, like, two or three more days. And that's how I was able to stop taking it completely. Wow. But, the, but thank God. Thank God you did. And very quickly, relatively quickly. Pretty quick. It's, it's supposed to, I had um, very good nurses and people that would come to talk to me to give me their own feedback. They used to think about that medication, the addiction, and the whole thing. And one lady told me, you know, you need to come off of that medicine because um, I've seen people that have their lives destroyed because of it. Their marriage have been destroyed. Their kids' lives have been destroyed just because of that addiction. So you need to get rid of it. So I knew I had to, but it was really hard. So I had to, you know, and I had come out of the hospital and I was saying to myself, now I have to deal with it. This is awful. You know, I thought I was done and then I had to deal with this whole addiction problem. Now, would you, do you think that that's part of the reason why you don't want to undergo another surgery? Repeat that. Is, is that part of the reason why you don't want to undergo another cosmetic surgery? No, it isn't part of the reason. I don't want to undergo the surgery just because I, I'm okay living the way that I, I live. I, I'm okay with myself. Um, no. 
That's fa that's fantastic. <laughs> I just I thought that maybe um, having to undergo another surgery, you would have to be on some kind of pain medication, mm -hmm. and that there might be a, a fear associated with that. But you definitely gave me the better answer. <laughs> <laughs> you know, a lot of people go an entire lifetime and and don't ever get to a point where they feel a hundred percent happy with themselves and, and feel comfortable in their own skin. So I think the fact that you've overcome all of this, you've survived an injury, because I, I think um, it's a miracle that you even survived this entire ordeal. The fact that you can come out of this and, and, and feel this way about yourself uh, is, is really a magnificent thing. It's, it, it would have been better if you would have felt that way years Before. ago. <laughs> You know, uh, that's one of the lessons uh, here. I mean, what what do you recommend to the viewers watching that are in a that because this is a, this is a very common thing. I know many people that have gone overseas uh, or even uh, within our country that have undergone a cosmetic surgery. I mean, what is the best advice you can give uh, to someone looking to, I, looking to get a procedure done? I think it's uh, just better to be safe than sorry. And it's better, for, like you mentioned earlier, to do your own research. And um, when you go to a surgeon, you know for sure that they're, you know, uh, have a valid license. I didn't make any of these researches, so it would have been good if I would have. I did them after what happened. And then, yes, they have their licenses, but they were not doing things properly. Um, I think it's better to pay than sorry, but pay more now than later, you know. That's what I recommend. Definitely. Well, and I, and I want to add to that, you know, uh, de you should definitely consider, uh, again, going uh, accompanied by someone that you trust so that if you're not able to make a decision on your own, somebody can make it on your behalf that really has your best interest at heart. Um, maybe, maybe getting, uh, you know, in your particular case, you had a friend that had been there recently. You had a friend that had been there recently, and that was your uh, testimonial, so to speak, in, in, in helping you choose this particular doctor. Um, I think that, that it would be a good idea in, for other people to consider getting multiple uh, references from the doctor. If you visit a doctor and you want to receive a procedure by them, have them give you a list of references, people that you can call and ask about the experience. You know, the experience isn't just about the surgery, it's also about their nurses, it's about uh, how they take care of you from that right. moment on, you know, once, once you're, you're out of the surgery, no? So, right. you know, there's, there's definitely, in every country, there has to be, uh, uh, there has to be uh, legal legalities that go with uh, these types of claims. Uh, you should definitely, uh, figure out in the particular country that you're visiting uh, what measures you can take if if you're the victim of a malpractice. Uh, Ned, I want to thank you for being with us today. Uh, for our Spanish-speaking viewers, we're going to be on in about uh, 30 minutes, hopefully, with uh, the Spanish version of the program. I'm really proud of you. I think you've uh, you. come out of this like a Wonder Woman. <laughs> and if anybody has any questions, for Annette or any, any comments, you can email me at michelle at onlyonetv.com. Thank you so much for joining us today. And uh, see us again next week on Tuesday for the next episode of The Michelle Show. Bye. <laughs>